Okay, good morning again, everyone. Now, uh, can I just check people can hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Good. So I just want to talk really only about the assignment two today, as I mentioned in the uh, message there yesterday, I think. So if you go to Moodle and uh, go into the uh, assignment section, then you've hopefully had a, a look at the specification before this lecture. And there just this morning, I've added just some PowerPoint slides. There, there aren't many uh, that I'll just uh, talk my way through as the beginning of this lecture. And then I'll talk my way through the actual assignment specification and give you an opportunity to ask any questions if you've got any questions. So let's start with these slides here. Uh, you have a sense now of the overall uh, objective of the assignment, which is to develop a CICD pipeline for the second assignment in the Web App Dev 2 module. So again, those the two modules are tightly coupled and you will be using a bit like assignment one really, you will be using the same kind of project folder on your desktop for both assignment number two for both of these modules. And so you'll be committing some of the commits that you will be making will be related to development work that you're doing for the web app dev module. Some of the commits will be related to this module, the agile module. And as with assignment one, you will have two remote uh, repositories, one for GitHub, which will be for Frank's side, and you will have a GitLab repository as well. So they'll be very similar to the assignment one and assignment two in that sense. So if I bring up the slides. And so I am kind of assuming now that you have at least read over the specification. Right, so, and also I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping that you have done the, my lab for this week, um, because that also kind of covers this general area. So what I'm saying here is that when you're running and this slide is when you're running an API in development mode, as you know, and this is what you've been doing in the labs for the web app dev two module, you've been using something called Babel node uh, to run your web API. And as you know, what Babel node provides is provides all of these kind of nice features. It's watching for changes that you might make to your source code. And if you do, then it reloads the web API server, uh, does live reloading, and it does transpilation on the fly. So it's doing that all behind the scenes, as you know. But as you know from my lab this week, if we want to deploy our web API to some sort of hosting platform like Heroku, then the, our source code needs to be built. In other words, it needs to be transpiled back to ES5 and Babel will do that for us. There's a Babel compiler uh, that will do that for us. And we did that in the lab this week. Uh, so we know all of that, hopefully. Uh, all I'm saying down here is that in terms of writing automated tests for a web API, the general rule is that you would have one test file per endpoint. So for example, in the movies web API, uh, currently anyway, there are two endpoints. There's a user's endpoint and a movie's endpoint. And so we would have two test files, but you might have more endpoints in which case you'd have more test files. Also, I guess if one endpoint 
had a lot of features to it, you may decide to break that up into more than one file. And uh, in terms of test isolation, as we saw in my lab for this week, in order to guarantee uh, that each test case was completely isolated from its predecessor and successor, then what we actually did in our before and before each hooks was we reloaded the express server every time. Uh, now, what didn't arise in the lab, my lab for this week, and uh, we kind of skirted over it really, uh, but in the assignment, what you need to be aware of is that you have to really release the whatever port the web API is using. In our case, it was using port 8080. You have to release that port or that port has to be released each time between each test case. Um, now, that's kind of taken care of for us automatically anyway when we uh, when we shut down the express server. Uh, but just to be aware of it, that it does need to happen. And also between each test case, we need to essentially kind of reset whatever database we're using as our test database for uh, our web API. And again, we have that code in this week's lab. Uh, I come back to this port thing, maybe uh, at, in our last slide. Uh, so if I just move on anyway. So the main focus is all about continuous delivery, continuous deployment. That's a uh, central point of the second assignment. And this is a slide that we had from a couple of weeks back, really. Um, and just to refresh our memories, what is the difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment? Uh, I'm saying continuous delivery there is a development discipline where build where you build software in such a way as, in such a way that the software, and this is the important bit, can be released to production at any time. So the idea there is that the decision to release your most recent build of your web API to a production environment is something that is decided by some sort of senior person in the software development team. And it's they decide uh, whether we should actually release this build out into the production environment. It's kind of a manual step, if you like. But the CICD pipeline, uh, we can build that into the CICD pipeline. And I'll uh, give you an indication of what that looks like in a few moments. But it is a human kind of decision. It's not automatic. That's continuous delivery. Uh, continuous deployment is where it is automatic. Every time we push an update uh, of our source code to our GitLab repository, it goes through the full pipeline of building, testing, deploying it to the staging environment, and also automatically deploying it to the production environment. With the continuous delivery, it stops after it has deployed it to the staging environment and it essentially waits for somebody to decide whether it should be deployed to the production environment or not. And if they do decide, then it's literally the click of a button to trigger the stage that concerns itself with deploying it to the production environment. The deployment to the production environment is, is just another stage in our pipeline, but in the continuous delivery stage, uh, sorry, in the continuous delivery case, that stage is not executed automatically. In the continuous deployment case, it is executed automatically. That's the difference. Uh, well, we kind of know this. Uh, how, how do we achieve continuous delivery, continuous deployment? Uh, we need to have, first of all, we need to have continuous integration. Continuous integration now implies that we are deploying our application to the staging environment every single time. Um, we need to run automated tests. That's fine. We know about that. We need to deploy a build to the... Pro I'm saying there, number three, we deploy a build to a production-like environment. That's what we often call a staging environment. Um, 
that happens automatically. And number four then is this decision whether we should release it to production or not. Uh, okay, and the why, well, we know, we know all the good reasons why continuous delivery, continuous deployment, continuous integration is a good idea. This is a slide we also had before, and it kind of compares the difference between continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment. Uh, it's slightly different from the way I did it in the labs, but that's okay. There, there's no one definitive um, pipeline, if you like. But if we look at the continuous integration process, kind of first, yeah. Um, now, in our case, we had a we had an installed. Uh, stage that uh, installed all the dependencies. Then we had a build stage. Now our test stage was more a, a API testing stroke integration testing as opposed to unit testing, but that's okay. We had a test stage and then we had a deployment to uh, our staging environment, which was Heroku. Uh, we did that in this week's lab. So we, we've seen all of that uh, in action. Now, sometimes you can actually do testing after it has been deployed to the staging environment. Uh, this testing would involve testing the application, uh, um, testing it in its staging environment as opposed to a kind of a local. Now we didn't do that, but it wouldn't be a big step to, to achieve that, but we've left that out. Then if we move on to continuous delivery, okay, so we can see it's much the same all the way up except again now we're assuming this part is out except when we get to here with continuous delivery there is the option to go from this stage on to this stage but the step is manual you know if you can read that there that that transition is a manual step so somebody has to press a button uh, on our gitlab pipeline uh, in order to trigger this stage and all this stage involves is deploying your, uh, your web API to the production environment. Often, as I say in, in one of the slides later on, the production environment and the staging environment, in our case, they may both be Heroku based, but they're just two different apps up in Heroku. One of the apps is only available to the development team itself. The other app is available to your users. That's continuous delivery. And the last one then is continuous deployment. And what's the difference between That's... continuous delivery and continuous deployment? Mm -hmm. I'll be tired of me saying it at this stage, but mm -hmm. the main difference is this bit here. Sorry, this bit here. This step is automatic. So provided all of these, of course, it's all on the assumption that all of these stages are successful. So if the build is successful, the testing is successful, the deployment to your staging environment is successful, if all of them are, are successful, then automatically it gets deployed to your production environment. And that happens every time somebody pushes an update to uh, the central repository. So it's really kind of advanced software houses that would have continuous deployment practiced uh, on a regular basis, but it's, it, is, it is happening out there, as they say. I'm going to stop for a second. Are there any questions? No. Uh, so continuous delivery. So the idea is that in, in the continuous delivery, that's the middle one there uh, in the previous slide, the last uh, stage of the pipeline is deploying it to the production environment. But as I've said too many times, probably already in this lecture, it's a manual step. Uh, staging uh, and production, I'm saying here, are two different, are the staging and production platforms are, sorry, uh, maybe the actual same platform. So in our case, it may be Heroku in both cases, uh, but really they're just two different apps that are up on the staging platform, oh, sorry, that are up on the hosting platform. And, uh, that's fine. Um, and I've already said this, that the staging uh, app is only available to your development team. It's only the development team know about it and know how to access it. Uh, whereas the production 
one is available to your users, whoever your users may be. If it's a web API, then maybe your users are other developers out there that want to write a front end that communicates with your web API or whatever. Now, uh, in the case of GitLab, um, what I'm showing you here is a screenshot from a pipeline that I've put together. And if you look at this part here, right? So I have, uh, and this is kind of linked to the this week's lab. So this is my install stage that installs all the node modules. This is my build stage. This is my testing stage where I run all of my mocker tests. This stage here is the deploy my app to the staging environment. And the last one then, there's a slightly different symbol here, but this is GitLab's symbol for indicating this stage is awaiting for some manual input. That's the comment I'm writing here. So the stage, this final stage has not executed. It's waiting for somebody to trigger the execution of it. If I flip over to GitLab. Here it is here. And if I mouse over it, Um, it's telling me, well, it's saying it's skipped as in it hasn't been executed. Uh, so it's waiting for somebody to trigger it. And how do you trigger it? Well, if you just click on it, sort of left click on it, there's a kind of a play button here. And if you click that, that will trigger the execution of this final um, stage. Any stage can be a manual stage. It's up to you really but uh, certainly in the case of classic kind of CI, CD, uh, the, this stage uh, in the context of continuous delivery, this stage would be the stage that, uh, that deploys my application to the production environment. And you can see I have another running of the same pipeline here. And so obviously I must have played the last stage and that caused it to be deployed to the production environment. Quite often you might have, uh, you know, you might have this, you might have a number of the executions of this pipeline where the last stage hasn't ever been executed because the senior person in the development team decided, no, we're not actually going to deploy this version of the API to the production environment. We'll wait until the next build because the next build is gonna have some other feature to it. You know, it's, it's a management decision if you like. But that's what it looks like anyway in the case of GitLab. And in order for you, of course, from, from a, an assignment point of view, eventually what you will want to do is you want to click that button there to make sure that the deployment to the production environment actually works properly. Um, that's that. Uh, continuous deployment then the difference uh, again, as I said, in the continuous deployment case, the last stage of the pipeline is again about deploying to your production environment, but in this case, it happens automatically. And you're, you're going to have in your, in your YAML file, in the case of GitLab, in your GitLab YAML file, your YAML file will deal with both cases, continuous delivery and continuous deployment. But the way you kind of uh, separate them out is based on uh, a branching policy. So I'm just saying here, for example, typically your continuous delivery uh, your continuous deployment, sorry, will be based off the master branch, whereas the continuous delivery will be based off of some other branch other than the master branch. So that's how you separate them out, but it's the, it's the one YAML file that will take care of both cases.
Now, uh, that's all I'm going to say about uh, CD. Uh, I'm going to just one or two points that I want to mention in relation to testing, and it's specifically targeting your second assignment now. So as you know from the work that you've been doing in the labs in the web in the web app dev module, so Frank has introduced authentication using JWT tokens, and he has shown you how certain routes in your web API can be kind of protected or private. In other words, the user has to have logged in before they can actually access the route. Uh, again, using JWT tokens. So this is something from a testing point of view that we would want to test. We would want to test, can we access a particular private route when we're not logged in? And if we're not, do we get the right response back from the web API? And secondly, we would want to test a protected or private uh, route when we are logged in and does it return the right result in that case. So how do we actually programmatically implement the logging in before we try and access a protected route? And that's what I'm showing you on this screenshot here. Uh, so I'm giving you this code. Um, and so we are in the, what you see here in the before each block, and this is specifically related to the, uh, the web API that you're developing in the, the other module now, you know that if we send a request, a post request to this URL, uh, and we're not specifying that the action is registration, then effectively what we are trying to do here is we're trying to log in. Uh, and, press, and specifying the username and password, and let's assume this is a valid username and password combination from my database. And in the, in the response that's coming back, really all I'm interested in here is grabbing the token in the response that's coming back from this particular request. And I know, and you know, that the token is going to be inside in the body. So res.body.token is going to be contain my JWT token, and I'm assigning, assigning it to this variable here. And you can assume that this variable has been declared at the top of my file. And it's gonna look just like this, right? But that's declared at the top of the file so that it can be accessed by any of my test cases. That's in my before each block. So I've logged in now successfully. And here now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to access the API slash movies endpoint. I'm trying to do a get request to that endpoint, and as you know, that endpoint is protected. Uh, and here's how I send the token in my request. This is how I do it in using super test. And assuming that I've implemented it all properly, then in this case, anyway, uh, one of the things I'm doing is I'm checking that I got 20 movies back. And maybe I should do some more assertions as well. But you have the so you have the outline there of how to implement testing of uh, protected or private routes in a web API. Of course, I'd also have to write tests where I don't log in beforehand. So you can uh, you can use that, and you you will definitely be using this code in your in your own assignment too. For me, any questions about that? No. Uh, one or two other little things. Uh, some of them we saw in this week's lab, but in the whole area of testing principles, like one of the things I often mention is about the silent principle. Now, if you have console.log statements in your web API, then the, those console.logs are going to appear in your uh, test execution, and we don't like that. We prefer uh, all of those things to be silent. Okay, the, the console.logs are important maybe when you're running it in, in a production environment or also when you're just running it manually yourself locally on your desktop and you want to see you're doing some debugging, then the console.logs are very useful to you. But when we're running tests, we don't want to see them. So as I did in this week's lab, um, I changed, I introduced uh, you to a small little uh, third-party module called log level. Uh, it's just an NPM install, 
and you essentially replace all your console.logs with invocations of log level. Um, and what log level allows you to do is to categorize the different console logs that you want to do. Uh, I think it defines five categories, uh, tracing, debugging, information, warning, error. These are the five levels where error is at the highest level, tracing is the lowest level. And what I'm showing you here is, and we did it in this week's lab is, I'm in my index.js, uh, in my express app file, I'm checking to see, am I running in testing environment? And if I am, then I'm setting the log level to, uh, I'm setting it to warning. What that means is that I only want console.logs, well, sorry, I want, only want log outputs that are related to warning messages or error messages. Obviously, I want to see those in my tests output because there's something wrong. But anything below that and below that would be information related uh, logging output or debugging logging output or tracing logging output. So I'm setting it to warning if I'm in test mode. Otherwise, I'm saying I'm setting it to the info level. So uh, that would be when I'm in either production or development mode. Uh, so th there's going to be a lot more console.log outputs happening when you're in production or development mode than there is when you're in testing mode. So that's how you control what outputs happen to your terminal. And down, okay, well, that's, that's the first thing, right? The second thing I want to talk about is this whole idea of reloading your Express app every time between each test case to achieve this test isolation uh, principle. The previous one I was talking about is test uh, the silent principle. For test isolation, you need to reload the, uh, the Express app. Now, in order to release the port, there's a slight difference between the way I did it in this week's lab and the way you need to do it in your assignment. And I'm showing you exactly here what the difference is. So this code excerpt here is coming from the index.js. That's the top level index.js. And what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that what I'm actually exporting here is a variable called server. Now, where does that server get initialized? It's happening in this line here. When you uh, invoke app.listen, app is my express uh, is my express app. Um, what the express.listen method returns is essentially a reference to the server on which your express app is running. And that's what I'm exporting here, that server. Now, who's going to import this? My test code is going to import it. So you will be importing the server and all of the code that I've given you in this week's lab works exactly the same. Uh, the difference was in this week's lab, what I was actually exporting from this file was the app variable itself. Uh, but you just need to make this change to index.js. You can even make it to this week's lab and everything will work exactly the same. And the, the reason I need to do that is in my testing code, if you remember in this week's lab, I close off, I call the close method of my Express uh, API. Now that close method uh, will effectively release the HTTP port 8080. Uh, it's gonna work for me uh, because I've changed what I'm exporting here to be the actual server rather than the actual Express app itself. So in short, even and you can do it in this week's lab, make this change in this week's lab to your index.js, run your tests and everything will be the exact same. You don't have to make any change to the tests that I gave you. Right, that's all I wanna talk about uh, in terms of background, in terms of the actual specification itself.
kind of covered a lot of the ground really, but uh, I'm just to fly through it and give you a chance to ask any questions. Okay, we know what the objective of the assignment is. Uh, this is the delivery date. Similar type of deliverables to the first assignment for me. Uh, obviously the Git log is very important. The readme is extremely important. I will give you a template readme for this assignment uh, later on. Here's my grading spectrum. So if you wanna, if you're aiming for between 40 and 55, then really what I'm looking for is that you have written tests for all of the functionality that you, ha you already have from the web app dev labs, because in my lab for this week, I didn't write, uh, I didn't write all the tests that were required based on the functionality that was in the web API. I just gave you some small examples, but you would have to complete that and you would have to write tests for whatever functionality you implement as part of your assignment to for the web app dev module. And the assumption is that the functionality that you have developed for the web app dev two assignment is fairly straightforward. So all I'd be looking for is that you just have uh, accompanying tests for all of the functionality in your particular web API that you have developed for the web app dev two module. Um, I'm always interested in making sure that you're adhering to the testing principles. That's the silent principle, the test isolation principle, but I've given you a lot of the code really to achieve that. Uh, by clear test documentation, the test documentation is the actual text strings that you pass to your it blocks and your describe blocks. Make sure that they are clear uh, and express exactly what the tests are about. And you've lots of examples of that from the uh, from the labs for me. From a uh, kind of GitLab point of view, what I want to what I'll be looking for is that you have essentially a basic pipeline, uh, and that really means the pipeline that I have given you for this week's lab. So you can essentially lift the YAML file from this week's lab, uh, drop it into your project, and Okay, there may be slight little changes that you have to make, but you essentially have the majority of it. Any questions about that? Moving on to the next grade between 55 and 75. So in terms of testing here, I'll be looking to see that you have a, a lot of error handling testing done because there are a lot of error cases really that can arise errors related to uh, trying to access parts of your web API when you're not authenticated or logged in and it requires login. So you need to test all of those. Testing when you're logging in and you are you have the right username but the wrong password. Testing when you have the wrong username and wrong password. In other words, the person hasn't registered yet. Testing the actual registration process, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think Frank gave you some simple example of uh, checks that might be done on the password to make sure it's a secure password. So you could have a test where you try and register a user with a bad password and you know you should get back the appropriate response from the web API. So there's lots of error cases. Frank, Frank also mentioned in his specification that he was looking for mongoose validators so that would be when you're trying to post data to your web API and that data is meant to be stored in the database, Mongoose can carry out validation of that data. Now, supposing your data fails those validation tests, then uh, your web API is gonna send whatever response back to the invoker. Uh, and in our case, we will make sure that we have test cases that try to pass or post data to our web API where the actual data fails some of those validations. Again, that's all in the case, that's all in the realm of error kind of handling. So there's lots of error cases uh, that you should, that you need to try and uh, ensure you've covered. Uh, test case structure, well, you know, uh, because there's so many different scenarios in terms of errors, et cetera, et cetera, you should have lots of nesting really of describe blocks with, with inner describe blocks and inner inner describe blocks, et cetera. Um, so I'd be looking for that. 
uh, Frank mentioned in his API and in his assignment specification that uh, you, you should have, uh, maybe you might have some advanced API functionality associated with your web API implementation. Will equally you need to have tests for that, what, whatever that materializes as for you. In terms of CICD, then you would need to extend the pipeline that you have up here. You need to extend it to include continuous delivery and continuous deployment. And that's really just going to be two new stages. Um, and those stages, one will implement continuous delivery, the other will implement continuous deployment. Uh, and they'll probably, probably be uh, branch oriented as well. Now, I haven't, I have not told you how to make a particular stage manual. You'll have to read up on that to see how you do it, but it's a fairly simple thing and it shouldn't take you much Googling to find the answer. Uh, so I'd be looking for all of that. Um, oh yeah, there's a branching policy that you need to follow, which I document at the bottom of this page. If you wanna move into this category, then really all I'm, I'm only saying one thing really, uh, if you have, if you deploy your web API to some other hosting environment other than Heroku, I'm mentioning some of them here. Uh, where do I mention them? Oh yeah, here, here are some of them. So Netlify, you probably haven't heard of Netlify. Uh, but you can Google it, Elastic Beanstalk, you may have heard of that. It's uh, provided by AWS, Google App Engine. I think actually Firebase also allows you to, uh, sorry, Firebase also provides a hosting service. So a lot of you have used Firebase for your authentication. You might just Google around deploying a web API to Firebase and see, can I actually automate that in my uh, GitLab pipeline. If not, uh, Netlify, I think is a fairly straightforward uh, hosting environment to deploy to. Uh, so I'll let you read around that for yourselves. But that's really all I'm looking for. One thing is all I'm looking for to get into this category, assuming of course that you've satisfied all of the other stuff uh, above here. And then if you're aiming for this then again, there's only one thing that I'm asking you to look at, and that is a platform called Optimizely. What Optimizely allows you to do is to uh, add what are called feature flags to your web API implementation. And what a feature flag is, is a way of enabling or disabling particular routes in your web API. So I might be developing a new root in my web API, uh, but I, I don't want that root to be available in production or be available, sorry, to my users uh, initially, but maybe later on, I do want to make it available to them. But rather than making it available by having to make some code changes, ideally, I'd like to be able to just toggle some switch and the toggling of that switch will either enable or disable this new feature that I have in my code, it has been deployed to production, but I can actually control whether users can access it or not. And I might enable it today and users can access it, uh, but uh, next week I might actually disable it for whatever reason, because users are having some issues with it. But the disabling of it doesn't require me to do a completely new build and a new deployment, all I have to do is toggle a switch using this Optimizely platform and it will do it for me. Now that does sound a bit vague, admittedly. Um, you have to read up on it. And I'm giving you one link here to an article that explains this whole area of feature flags and how you actually program them in a Node application. You can use them with any type of application. We could have actually used them with React we could have made part, parts of our React app uh, active or inactive um, at the kind of press of a button without actually having to go through rebuilding our app in order to enable or disable our, the particular feature. So it's 
cross application really. So some, some reading involved uh, in order to get that working. And all I would be looking for is a fairly simple illustration of it working. You don't have to have anything too fancy. Now it's easy for me to say, but there actually isn't a whole lot involved in it, but you, you have to get to the stage where you realize that I suppose. And from a coding point of view, there isn't a lot involved in it either. Um, the, I, I guess the, the challenge is to be able to read about it and understand what uh, the articles are telling you. And there's lots of videos showing you how to actually um, use this optimizely platform. So it's interesting, but uh, see how you get on with it if you want to aim for that, um, that grade. My branching policy is, uh, I've kept it simple really for this case. There's only two branches that you're gonna have, a developed branch and a master branch. Every time you push to the developed branch, it's gonna trigger the pipeline that's gonna run your install phase, your, your install stage, your test, your build, your deployment to the staging environment. And the last uh, stage is going to be the manual one where the user, where the, um, you, you have to decide whether you want to deploy to the production environment as, or, or not. When you push to the master branch, it's going to be essentially your continuous deployment pipeline where the deployment happens to the staging environment and to the production environment. Now, what, when I talk about staging and production environments here, uh, essentially you are going to have two apps set up on your Heroku uh, account. One will be for staging, one will be for production. That's all it means really. And it would make sense maybe that the app names have staging and production in them just from a from my point of view really, but they can be named anything that you want to name them. And it means that you're gonna have extra environment variables in your GitLab uh, set up. So some of those environment variables will be relating to the staging app. Others will be related to the production app. Right, um, that's that. Um, are there any questions I wonder about the actual specification? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, do we need to uh, deploy two variants of my apps uh, because uh, of the uh, yes. yeah, developers uh, branch and the master branch? Um, so in the develop branch, it will automatically deployed, it should automatically deploy to the staging app. And then the deployment to the production app will be this manual stage at the very end. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it'll be like, uh, it'll be exactly like Uh, it look exactly like this. Okay, yeah. so this is going to this stage, this job is going to deploy it to the staging app. This job is going to deploy it to the production uh, app, but it won't run unless you click I do it play. manually. Yeah. Oh yeah, I get it. Whereas, so this might be, this would be, this would resemble your develop branch now. Whereas for the master branch, whenever you push to the master branch, uh, if it all runs successfully, then you're going to have tick, 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 tick automatically. Oh yeah, I get yeah. it. Thank you. Good. Anything else I wonder? Um, do you remember just with regards to the um, submission date for this, um, mm -hmm. for Frank's app, we don't, it's it's the 15th of January. So would, if they're to line up, would mm. this one need to be pushed forward as well? No, I wouldn't be pushing it forward that degree now really. Um, 
I'm, I'm not keen on pushing it into uh, into January. I'll, I'll talk to App Art to Frank. Sorry, but my sense is that it won't. So whatever you have achieved by the third, um, that's going to be it really for me. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you may have more functionality that you have made available for Frank, and that's fine. But I will judge you on the basis of uh, what you've what you've submitted or what you've um, submitted by the third. So the README would have to reflect that. Yeah. And then my, uh, I'm really more interested in CI/CD testing error handling. So a lot of that should, I guess you should orientate your web API development in the knowledge that you are going to have to submit mine earlier than his. So do a lot of uh, uh, implementation of error handling and testing of error handling. And that's, I would be satisfied with that. So the other advanced features that you might develop for Frank or whatever other kind of extra bits that you might have for Frank may be more concerned with functionality rather than um, the whole kind of error handling side of things. And that's just more tests really. So more straightforward kind of normal tests. So you should have a good number of normal test cases um, implemented by the 3rd of January. But I'll have a chat with Frank about that actually. Thanks. Okay, anything else? No, okay, so I'm gonna stop here. And that's it really. Um, so hopefully you found the module uh, interesting and useful to you and enjoy the break, despite the fact that you have two assignments, if not more to work on over the break. But So I will talk to you again in January. All right, bye for now. Thanks, Derwood. Thanks, David. Bye-bye, David.